of the Dallas County Historical Foundation. Today, as a part of our oral history project, we're interviewing Marilyn Sitzman, an eyewitness to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. First, Ms. Sitzman, I'll call you Marilyn if you, if you don't mind. Thank you for agreeing to this interview. For the record, please give us your full name and your date and place of birth. It's Marilyn Sitzman, December 14th, 1939, Lafayette, Colorado. To establish how you came to be in Dealey Plaza on the day of President Kennedy's visit, uh, tell us what your employment was back there in that year. Uh, I worked for Jennifer Dallas, which was owned by Mr. Abraham Zapruda and Erwin Schwartz. And uh, I was employed there as the secretary for the Jennifer of Dallas. And also I did the receptionist work. Tell us in as much detail as you can recall the scene around your place of business on the morning of uh, the assassination. Okay. That morning, one of the first questions we were asking Mr. Zapruda is if he brought his camera, because he was planning, he'd been planning for a couple of months already to go down and watch the motorcade, and he didn't bring his camera. So his assistant, Lillian, and I persuaded him to go get his camera, that he needed to take these pictures for his grandsons and for his children and etc. And we knew he really wanted to take the pictures anyway. So about 10 o'clock we convinced him to go home and get his camera. Now personally I had not planned on watching the motorcade. When they closed for the motorcade I was going to go down to the bank and open me a bank account. And so we closed up and I walked down, it was about five blocks in the opposite direction. And I went down there to open my checking account, and they were closed for the motorcade. So I guess I'll go watch. So I watched, walked all the way back down. Now, I knew where they were going to be because there was major discussion on it. About the route? About, about where they were going to be. Oh, I see. You mean Mr. Zapruder? Mr. Zapruder, yeah. Who else from the uh, office was there? A couple of other office people oh, okay. that were there. And Lillian stayed at the office, and the rest of us all wanted, you know, they, they wanted to go down and watch, and they all decided on the Daily Plaza. So I just walked down there, and as I came down that street, Mr. Zapruda and a couple of the other women were sitting, or standing up on the top, and Mr. Zapruda, the first part of that film, shows me walking up towards him. And I got up there, he turned off the camera, and we're talking about, well, where can he stand? Because by this time, there was quite a few people gathering. And we'd go look at this place, and we'd go look at that place, and we went over that concrete pair quad was, and we decided that would be the best place, because I said, you can get up here, and you'll be above everybody. No matter how many people are down here, you don't, don't have anybody blocking your view. Did you advise him this, or everybody? I did. Uh -huh. And so he said, well, he had vertigo, though. If he got up there, he'd get dizzy. So he said, you'll have to stand behind me and hold on to me. I said, it's no problem at all. So we both got up there, and I stood behind him, and I held on to him. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, was there any hesitation on his part to go home and get his camera? Because that was such a historic film. No, he wanted to do that in the first place. Mm -hmm. He always wanted to do that. He mm -hmm. just wanted to be convinced to do that. Mm -hmm. When um, there is part of the, the, something that's been uncovered is that he tried out a little bit of the film ahead of time to be sure the camera was working all right and, so, and caught some of the motorcycle policemen. Uh, were, were you, do you remember, do you recall that kind of testing the first few feet of film? No, uh, like I said, I know he took a picture of me as I walked up. Mm -hmm. Then we stood up there. He may have taken the shots to see what his view was. I only remember when they started to make their first turn turning into the street. And he says, okay, here we go, or something to that effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's when I remember we started actually doing the filming. Before the filming began and the shots rang out, what was the atmosphere, what was the feeling there on the plaza? Oh, everybody was yelling and screaming, yay, and, you know, that type of thing. Very upbeat. Oh, yeah, yeah, very, uh -huh. very. Okay, then you, you saw the, the motorcade turn the corner. And yeah, they turned out. the corner and they started coming down. And the first thing I remember hearing are what I thought was firecrackers, because Kennedy threw his hands up, and I heard bang, bang. Now, there could have been a third bang. I can't swear to that one. But I know there was two bangs very close together, and I thought it was firecrackers because of the arms going in the air. And it was way off to my left and above. So, you know, I'm just kind of 
like, what a stupid thing to throw firecrackers. And as they came down, the last shot that we heard was right in front of us. And it was like the same sound, far off and to the left. But I saw his head open up and I saw the brains coming down. So by this time, of course, I knew it wasn't firecrackers. But those were the only sounds I heard. Now, to uh, clarify it a bit, that would be towards the school book depository building? Towards or? our left and above. Which would be in the general area yes. of the sixth yeah. floor window. Yes. You now, excuse me, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. You right. didn't turn and look in that no, direction? No, you were neither one on. of us, neither yes. Mr. Zapruder or I turned ever. We kept our attention on what was happening exactly in front of us. And if you look at his film, there's very little jumping. It's steady, considering very, very what steady. was going on. And that's why I'm saying the sound we heard, the third sound, still sounded the distance. Because if it would have been as close as everybody's trying to tell us, you know, 20 feet behind us, we both... Fence, in other words. Yeah, mm -hmm. we would have jumped sky high. Now, you said you did hear another sound. Okay, after... You know, he fell through going under the triple underpass. And we're both still standing there, and then I heard this crash. And that's when both Mr. Zapruder and I kind of, like, did a, a second or whatever you want to call it. Double there was a double, there's a park bench on the other side of the car, the cement thing. And they were sitting in a park bench, and they dropped their pop bottle on that cement there and, cra and cracked it. That's what kind of woke us up, and that's when we got down off of the concrete. But, but that sound was, like, five, eight feet from us. Uh, with that, yeah, we did hear, but that's the only other sound other than that far away sound that we heard. Would that sound was not close enough to the other shots, though, to be mistaken for a shot? Do you think? No, I, it was it was glass hit and concrete. Distinctly, yeah, I, I knew exactly what it was when it hit. Mm -hmm. What is your analysis of the possibility of a gunman, a second gunman, being behind that picket fence? Well, after looking at the film and doing a lot of reading and other etc. I would say there's a very good possibility there was somebody back there, but they had a silencer. I don't know who was shooting where, but there was nobody standing behind us that close with a rifle without a silencer on it. Because uh, that would have had us jumping. Yeah. That, uh, it would have gone film, right by That film face. would have been yeah. bounced all over the place. Yeah, because literally it would have gone right past our ears. Did you see who it was that had dropped the bottle? What? It was a young couple. I can't. I couldn't describe them to you. It was a young couple, I would say, late teens. Mm -hmm. And they had a brown sack and, and the, the like pot they bottle. they their lunch? Yeah, yeah, they were out there eating their lunch. Mm -hmm. Did, what was your immediate rea your reaction now, immediately after those shots? Did you feel immediately that the president had been killed? Yeah. I mean, there was no question. I, mean, I saw the brains coming down the side of his head because we were that, you know, that close in front of us. I knew exactly what happened. When we got down, Mr. Zapruder apparently went directly back to the office. He didn't even stop. He, just, he must have gone directly back to the office. I ran down the slope. There were three men in suits running up, and that's who I met. And I said, they killed him, they killed him. And my boss has it on film. And that's when they got interested in me, when I said that. Were these three men in suits that were Secret Service men, or did they look like civilians? Or they, 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 were, they were suits. I call them suits, which would be, they could be Secret Service, FBI. I have no idea. They had to do with. Mm -hmm. But they so, wanted that film. Was there, did Mr. Zabruder say anything to you before you, you went one direction, he went the other direction, or you said anything to him? Or see, I, that I don't remember exactly if we said anything to, anything to each other when we got down. Or because I know myself, I was in a. Mm -hmm. You know, all I could think is they killed him. They killed him. That's all I could think. And he disappeared, so I assumed he went back to the office. Then when I met these guys in the suits, and they wanted to know where he was and who he was, I said, "Well, he's my boss, but I don't see him." And so they took me, literally took me back to the office, to find him. And by that time, he's he was already back there and apparently had called his lawyer and etc. he would not release that film to anybody. It was the smartest thing he did. We want to get back to that in just a moment, but, but first, do you recall any conversation with anybody else on the so-called grassy knoll? No. In, the, in that area? No. You don't recall any? I didn't talk to anybody. 
did was anybody saying as you were they must have killed him oh yeah there was people were screaming and I mean it was utter chaos by that time mm -hmm. but the first thing I can remember is after that pothole hit and I looked down at the surrounding everybody was laying flat on the ground almost there might have been one or two people still standing but I would say 98 percent of the people were still laying flat on the side of the hill and my thought was you know this is pretty stupid you standing up here you know <laughs> Mr. Z. yeah yeah that's what I was saying to myself here's Mr. Zbruda and I everybody else is laying down flat and these shots are flying everybody else has you know got a better idea we were kind of stupid but uh, I mean I, it's amazing how steady he was on that film that's why I still go on they had to have silencers because there's no jarring if there was a shot from the back yeah from the picket fence okay let's go back to you went back to the office and then what happened uh, well like I said they tried to get the film but they, he was in the inner office and they wouldn't let him in you mean Mr. Zapruder would not let them in they didn't show any kind of identification or yeah they said they had to wait till the lawyer got there <laughs> or something to that effect because nothing happened until he got his people in place who were the people he got in place I know? would imagine it was his lawyer and I, I remember I was kind of young then I don't remember who these people were you were Mr. Your yeah yeah um, okay, so the negotiations began with the advice of his lawyer then, as far as the film was concerned. I'm sure. Do you know I, what I wasn't involved on that. Do you know what transpired? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Absolutely none. All I know is eventually they all left the office, went over to FBI agency, they got the films. Uh, Eastman Kodak developed the films. Uh, Mr. Zapruder got the original back, and we saw the original the next morning. Did Mr. Zapruder stay right with that film as it was? He stayed with the film. Even at the Eastman Kodak? I think department. so. Uh -huh. You don't know when the negotiations began with Time or Life magazine? Uh, no. Time Inc. No. Like. No, that you'd have to uh, talk to his son, Henry, mm -hmm. or, you know, because I was not involved in that. Was his son involved in it, uh, in the negotiations, do you recall? Or, or did, I'm sure. No, he because he was in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure he would know what all happened. Mm -hmm. You don't know what the final figure was? No. That life and I never felt it was my business to ask. Uh -huh. um, there were reports. The only thing I remember is he gave Mrs. Tibbet $25,000 of mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and they didn't thank him. They didn't even send him a thank you note. <laughs> no thank you note? No acknowledgement? No, no acknowledgement. That always bothered me. Mm -hmm. They never came back and said thank you for or, or that we have received your check? No. But he did get the endorsed check back. Yeah. And there was never any acknowledgement from the Tippett family at all? That I know of, because I know that was a thorn in his side. How would you describe, say, Mr. Zapruder, his personality? What kind of He's a very sweet he? person. Yeah. He's fun to work with. He's a very family-orientated type place to work for. It's, you don't have places like that you work for anymore. I mean, that's really <laughs> Saturday evening post time. Uh, because, you know, he got involved with everybody, and he was just a really nice person. And he loved his children and his grandchildren. And he, he, it was just a nice place to work. Would you, how to describe the office? So what, what kind of business was it, and, and describe the makeup of the office? Okay, uh, we was were... Was it small? It was small. We made junior dresses and a Mrs. line. Went out to five lines a year. And uh, basically, there's Mr. Zapruda and Erwin Schwartz were partners. Erwin took care of most of the sales end of it, and hired the salesman and took care of that portion of it. Mr. Zapruda took care of, you know, everything else, doing the, you know, having the dresses made and everything. We had a factory there and where they sewed the dresses, plus we sent some out. And then we sent a lot of piecework out, too, because got pretty good size you know mm -hmm. medium size at best but they did a good business mm -hmm. and uh, it, it just I don't, I don't remember how many people in the office there was it's about four or five of us that worked in the office definitely itself. a small business yeah though. it was small you said he was an easygoing man did his personality change after he got probably the most famous film in the history of no uh, unless you get him off on the subject he was very emotional Mr. Zapruder was a very, very emotional person. And when it came to the Kennedy assassination, he, he, always, he still 
he still got very emotional about it. About how long after the assassination of President Kennedy did Mr. Zapruder die? I've forgotten that. I think he died in 67 or 68. Uh, four or five years. Yeah. After, so. Yeah. Was he, there discussion back in the office from the other people who were with you that went out and witnessed what you witnessed? Uh, did y'all talk about it? Uh, we talked about it a little bit, not too much, mm -hmm. because um, Mr. Spruit really, you know, I really didn't like to talk to him about it because he'd get so emotional. Well, and I did it. You said there were a couple of other people from the office. I mean, just. They didn't have much to say. Yeah. Everybody pretty much in general agreement about that. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, like I said, we came in the next morning, that Saturday morning, we saw mm -hmm. the film that morning. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Seeing the film was more realistic than actually seeing the actual thing happen. It was really, that's hard to explain. But watching that film made it more real to me than what I had saw the day before. The day before, was it more of a dreamlike quality? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it, it's, it's, you know it happened, but do you, do, I mean, I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. So when I saw the film, like, yeah, it happened because here it is now on film. Mm -hmm. Um. Certainly, newsmen began to come to to interview Mr. Uh, Zapruder and so uh -huh. forth. Did he submit to all these interviews, or did he? Was he not to all of them. Uh -huh. I don't know who all he did or did not talk to, and I don't know how he sorted them. But he didn't. He didn't uh, go for all of them. No. Uh -uh. Is there any question in your mind, in just in your impressions now? Uh, that there were three shots that came from the sixth floor of the school book depository building? I heard for sure three sounds that came from the same direction. As the school book depository building? Yes. Mm -hmm. As to say, did it come from the sixth floor window being fired by Oswald? I don't know. And I would never say I did. I've seen so much stuff since then. I find that the hardest to believe. But you do feel convinced that if anybody shot from behind the picket fence, that you were so close and would have been so close to the line of fire that you would have had to heard the reports unless there was a silencer on the, on the gun. Yes, yes, I, I, I definitely, and I have no qualms saying that I don't, I'm almost sure there was someone behind the fence or in that area up there. But I'm, a, I'm just as sure that they had silencers because there was no sounds. And the people who said they heard six or seven shots from back there I find that hard to believe. Just, just even looking at the film, because there's no jumps. I mean, in, in analyzing it afterwards, would that shot have missed? Was it the, that third shot when his head, when you saw his head explode? Was that at that instant, or was it? It was. You remember? It was pretty. You know, I don't know if the shot I heard was the one that opened his head, or if it was one from another side. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not that much of, you know tracer to see which direction it came from. I do know I saw this part of his head open up and come down the side of his face. Mm -hmm. But then I've also seen other pictures where the back of his head came off. So mm -hmm. there could have been two simultaneously shots at the same time. Mm -hmm. But you, you, did I understand you correctly that you do feel there was somebody behind the picket fence? I, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that some of the shots did come from that direction. But it's not because you heard the shots, it's because of what you... Because of other things, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. Were you part of any the official investigation? I mean, they came no. to interview Mr. Zafruder, but no. nobody ever asked I was totally interview. ignored. <laughs> nobody from Warren talked to me, no, no one of the FBI, none of the Secret Service, nobody. Absolutely nothing. After I got back to the office, I, nobody could have cared if I dropped in myself. Did that seem uh, odd to you? That no. Because was, it was 1963, I was female, and I was young, and mm -hmm. I was irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What about the House Investigations Committee that came back into Dallas about uh, how long afterwards, Bob, maybe 15 years afterwards, yeah. that they didn't interview you either? Nope. That, does it seem strange to you that, that somebody as close to the scene as you were would not at least be just questioned as we're doing? Just... Just it off to MCP, I guess, because yeah. I was just totally ignored. Well, now, you've, you've had several interviews fairly recently, haven't you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Why? But they've all been with reporters, uh -huh. not with investigators. Well, uh -huh. some of them call themselves investigators. 
<laughs> you mean the so-called investigative reporters? Mm -hmm. or, uh, now you say that with some sarcasm in your voice and in your emotions. Uh, you well, because these investigative reporters, unless you will report back to them, you heard exactly what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in you. Mm -hmm. One in, I could give a name, but called me up, set the, up the interview. Why don't you go ahead and give us the name? Mark Lane. Mm -hmm. Called on the telephone, set up the interview. Oh, the whole big thing, you know. You know, everything's all laid out. Last words, he said, now, you did hear those six shots behind you. I said, no, I never heard anything behind me. He said, oh, you know I never heard from that man again. <laughs> and that was just less than a year ago. Yeah. He was doing another reporting. But that's all he wanted to hear was he was going to have this, because there was a couple of the people who were on the other side of the street who said they heard and saw the shots from right behind us. That's all he wants to talk to. A lot of these investors, you know, they'll do that. They won't only hear their side of the, they don't want to hear a possibility of anything else or what you really honestly saw or heard. Do you ever talk to any of the other people who were witnesses, eyewitnesses to the assassination? Uh, only if they're doing a show together or something like that because I really never have gotten involved because <coughs> I know, I can't remember the lady's name, she was amazed because she had her little book out there with all of her pictures, and this is so-and-so, and do you remember what she said? And I said, I don't know who any of those people are. She knew everybody's name that was on both sides of that hill. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I've got better things to do with my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these people just got totally involved in the whole thing. This is all they cared about. Which well, of course, that continues to this day. As, uh, we're 30 years later, and probably when this film is being, this uh, tape is being seen by uh, historians a hundred years from now they'll still be talking about it. Uh, aren't you, uh, aren't you, uh, oh, uh, not impressed, but uh, doesn't it, the fact that you're part of history, uh, doesn't that mean something to you personally? Or Yeah, that's, people ask me that, but apparently it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, my 15 minutes of, uh, was the word? Oh, of uh, fame? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would have rather had it winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you said you'd really just kind of turned it off or didn't mention the people for years and years. Yeah, for, oh, it was yeah. almost 20-some years or so mm -hmm. because I just didn't want to sit around and talk about it. Mm -hmm. And since they didn't involve me with it, mm -hmm. I just didn't involve myself with it. Well, you were quick to, uh, to cooperate with us, and I very much appreciate it, as I said, and, and submit to this interview. Uh, did you ever decline interviews? I've declined some of them, yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it just depends. I'm doing a lot more now because my health is not good, and I don't know how long I'm going to be here. So I figured if I have anything to say, I better say it now. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, uh, at the close of these uh, discussions or near the end of the discussions, Bob, do you have anything before we ask for the? Uh, no, uh, go ahead. Uh, we. We just leave it open and just say anything you want to say, anything you want to get the record straight on anything where you might have been misquoted or anything like that, or, or just your views on the assassination in general. Well, there's a lot of things being said. There's, I watched the movie JFK. I enjoyed that, but I, it got too bottled. Everybody who could be involved was involved, <laughs> which after a while got comedy book, you know, a uh, comic book type thing. But a lot of it, there was a lot of stuff in there that was that was important and made a lot of sense. And I've read a lot of the books that they have, and uh, a lot of it makes sense. And I've talked to some of the people who were involved in it as far as like the doctor uh, at Parkland. And there's just, there's some interesting things going around. And I don't think we'll ever know. And I don't think Oswald did it. You don't think he was involved at all? or you? I or think he's just exactly what he said he was, was Patsy. Because there's too many times when they show that gun keeps, it's a magic gun. It keeps changing. And that one bullet is hilarious. So the so-called pristine bullet? Or the magic bullet, yes. the one that went mm -hmm. nine different directions. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. you know, th there was a lot of fabrication, but they're not going to let us know. You, when you say they, you're speaking of? The capital they with quotes. The CIA, the FBI. Whoever. The, Whoever they were, mm -hmm. 
If I knew the answer to that, then I'd probably be dead too. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Sisman. yes and no. I'm not one of the people who dwell on what happened that day. My feelings always have been we should care more about what, about what the man did when he was alive than what he did when he was, you know, died. And yet you stood right here with Mr. Zapruder while he rolled his famous film. Yes. You were right, you shoulder to shoulder with him, right? We were standing up here. Can you tell me about what happened, where you were, and why, why you happened to be here and uh, what you saw? Well, Mr. Z wanted to take pictures of the motorcade and he was down here filming. I walked up and he said he wanted to stand up here and take pictures and would I stand behind him and hold on to him because he had a ten tendency to get dizzy on high places, especially looking through the camera lens. So he st gets up here and I stand behind him and motorcade comes around the corner and he's filming and right up there at the first lamp post, it sounded like firecrackers and the president throws his hands up and I really thought it was firecrackers. It was like two, two, two firecrackers, right. otherwise two shots as far as I'm concerned. And I did not realize it was gunfire until the last bullet hit him right in front of us. And then there was no question because he was right in front of us and we saw the bullet hit his head and his head explode. And you thought, my God, this can't be. Well, no, I didn't think anything because your mind takes over at that time and you don't comprehend anything you're really seeing. It was mostly the next day when I saw the film when I actually realized what I had seen. Were you with Mr. Zapruder when he then looked at his own developed film and realized what he had? Oh, yeah. What was the feeling that he had then? I don't remember. I mean, I, I don't remember anybody else's feeling. I just remember mine. Did, what did you think when you saw the film? Well, it was horrible. I only saw it that once and never cared to see it again. Something you've pretty much erased from your mind. That's right. You are sure you heard two shots. That's interesting. Well, We've heard conflicting two reports. Two shots and then the third shot. Two shots and then the third shot. Yeah. So a total of three. Yeah. And you're very clear on that. Yeah. All from the same place, the same distance. The last shot sounded like a firecracker, too, except it was right in front of us, and I saw the damage it did. You're not one that believes that a shot came from another direction. No, especially the people who say it came from right back there. If it had been a high-power rifle that close behind us, both Mr. and Z and I would have come completely off the colonnade from the sound. So you're sure it came from that window? Oh, yeah. I mean, not from the window. I don't know where it came from. But I from that direction? It all came from over our left shoulder. Now, where it came from, what window, I don't know. Interesting that you'd rather review his life or think of his life, and I think that's a, a nice positive note that you put on the whole thing. And how do you remember John F. Kennedy today? You were so close at that moment. Oh, uh, the October crisis just before he came here, his Camelot speech, mostly his Camelot speech. As a good president, somebody you supported? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, I didn't really miss, I'm not a Democrat, but. I thought he was a good president, and I thought he was closer to the people than some of the other presidents were, and I thought he brought something to the presidency. If I don't care who they were, if they didn't like him, respect the office. He had something special. Sure. He was Camelot.
especially if something like that had fired, yeah. he would have been a, certainly the. Even if they'd been on that, you know, on top of there where they said something like that, right. it'd be a totally different sound from the destroyer. Right. Because wind would create it. It was a windy day about what it was for. Really? It's not a mysterious whodunit to you. Oh, I, I, I don't know who did it. Yeah, other than, I'm sure Oswald. I don't know. 